Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Building Bridges webinar on closing the infrastructure investment gap. My name is Kaylee Taylor, and I am the coordinator of Building Bridges Week, and I will be your moderator today. We have an extremely interesting discussion planned for you and a lot to pack into one hour. But before we dive into the discussion, I want to pass the floor over to Sandrine Salerno, who is the Executive Director of Sustainable Finance Geneva and a member of the Building Bridges High Level Group. And she's gonna say a few opening words on behalf of the founding partners. Sandrine, I pass it over to you. Thank you very much, Kelly Taylor. Hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to open this first webinar. As you know, we have just released the 2022 edition of Building Bridges. So go on your website and you will see the, the, the event 65 this year, but also the summit and what we will propose as a discussion from Geneva. This year, we are launching a series of online webinar to address innovative approaches of advanced finance. And this first webinar will focus on infrastructure finance. Thanks for joining us today. Kelly told me that I had only three minutes, so I think I cover up almost everything. Thank you very much for our brilliant speaker to be with us today. And I hope we will have a nice and inspiring discussion. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks so much, Sandrine. Now let's take a quick second to see who is in our audience today. So our team is gonna launch the poll and the first one is quite an easy one. We just want you to tell us what kind of organization you come from. The reason we ask this is because Building Bridges is all about bringing together a wide range of stakeholders to tackle sustainable finance issues and to create solutions. So we want to know the diversity that we have in the room today. And it's also a great opportunity to do a little bit of technology housekeeping. So for those of you who have not used Big Marker before, you'll notice on the right hand side, there's a, a panel with a chat, a Q&A, polls and handouts. And you can reference the polls at any time. You can see how they're going. You can check out a handout, which is the presentation that Cynthia is going to present or the, the report she's referring to. And most importantly, I will be directing the, uh, during the Q&A questions um, to the panel from the Q&A section. So please make sure to put any um, questions you might have in there so, and to vote on your favorite questions. So now that we have closed the poll, I see that we have quite a lot of, oh, sorry, it's still open here. So we have uh, quite a lot of um, diversity in the audience today, which is the name of the game with Building Bridges, where we have a lot of financial industry, NGOs and foundations, development finance institutions present, as well as UN and international organizations and corporates. I think everyone's still getting a handle of the technology, but there's gonna be another poll, so keep your eye out for that. So now that everyone is warmed up, let's move into our program. As you can see, we have an absolutely all-star lineup of speakers for you today. And we're gonna kick, kick off with some context setting from Cynthia Pastor, who is the Director of Economics at the Global Infrastructure Hub. Now the GI Hub publishes an infrastructure monitor report that provides a very extensive overview of the state of infrastructure financing globally. Cynthia, thank you so much for joining us all the way from Australia in the middle of the night. <laughs> we appreciate you making these difficult time zones work and I'm gonna pass it over to you to set the context for us. Thanks, Cynthia. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation and good afternoon, good evening today. Um, I am going to present as Kelly mentioned about the our latest report, Infrastructure Monitor. So, one of the instruments to close the infrastructure gap, as we know, is the mobilization of private capital. So this has, has become even more critical with the COVID-19 pandemic because it further uh, the limitations or like the financing capacity of governments. In this context, the G20, it's committed to a roadmap uh, of infrastructure as an asset class through which they are aiming to close this infrastructure gap by mobilizing more private capital into infrastructure. So our report, it's the Global Infrastructure Hub Annual Flagship Report, 
about the state of private investment uh, in infrastructure. We provide in-depth analysis of the current global levels of private investment and also about the infrastructure investment performance. So our tool provides uh, data insights and tries to ensure that the policy discussions around investment uh, in infrastructure are grounded in actual evidence of what is really happening. So the report is actually like the highlight that we have because the uh, infrastructure monitor is, is a live tool and we add content throughout the year. Every two weeks we publish data insights and every three weeks we also publish uh, policy blogs. Going to the key findings that I uh, you are seeing the first slide here of the infrastructure monitor. First, uh, globally, we see that private investment in infrastructure projects in primary markets remained resilient to the pandemic shocks in 2020, but has been stagnant for several years. In fact, we can see that if we compare it with the latest decade, there has been a slight decline. In this analysis, we are just looking into primary markets because we want to assess the new infrastructure created. So we exclude secondary market transactions. This um, resilience to the pandemic shock is actually a positive sign compared to other sectors because several sectors uh, of the economy were significantly affected by the pandemic, but private investment uh, in infrastructure somehow remained uh, resilient overall in 2020 compared to 2019. Next slide, please. So about uh, three quarters of the private investment in infrastructure projects uh, happens in high income countries, and this investment was unhindered by the pandemic. However, the remaining one fourth happens in middle and low income countries, and it fell in 28, by 28% in, in 2020. So a bigger question here that this graph and this information poses is until what extent private capital can help to close the infrastructure gap, especially in these middle and low income countries, which have attracted uh, private capital in a limited way. Next slide, slide please. So the pandemic impact varied uh, by infrastructure subsector. We have, for example, that the decline in the business activity due to all of the lockdowns and the restrictions in traveling negatively affect, affected the transport and the non-renewable sectors. But on the other hand, uh, the switch to online platforms and all the pandemic control activities supported the growth of the telecom sector and also the social infrastructure sectors. Next slide, please. So globally, renewable energy projects dominate private investment in infrastructure. In 2020, uh, renewables continue to attract the most private investment in infrastructure projects, accounting now for almost 50% of the private investment, mostly in Western Europe, in North America, and in wind and solar projects. Next slide. However, uh, there is still a long road ahead. While 54% of the private investment in infrastructure projects in high income countries happens in renewable energy, most of the private investment in infrastructure in the middle and low income countries takes place in the transport and non renewable energy sectors. But we are seeing an, an increase uh, within time in renewables against non renewables in these regions. So hopefully this trend will reverse, reverse uh, with time. Next slide. Although green investment currently represents, as I mentioned, half of the private investment in infrastructure projects, green investment outside renewable sectors still remains low. So in this graph, uh, we are showing that in less than a decade, green private investment in infrastructure projects has significantly grown and currently represents half of the private investment, but and is only um, renewables in high income. But green private investment in infrastructure still needs to increase significantly from the current levels uh, in order to reach, reach the net zero targets. And all the efforts to decarbonize infrastructure must look beyond renewables into other uh, sectors, for example, transport, where the green investment uh, still remains low. Next slide, please. So showing attractive financial performance is a key element in order to bring in more investment into infrastructure. 
special into sustainable uh, infrastructure. But unfortunately, um, sustainable infrastructure investment is constrained by um, limited on how ESG impacts uh, the financial performance, ESG factors. But encouragingly, preliminary evidence shows superior performance for some sustainable infrastructure investments in comparison with other infrastructure uh, sector investments. In this graph, uh, I am showing that uh, in the last 10 years, unlisted wind and solar equities have generated higher annual returns than listed and unlisted infrastructure equities. Next slide, please. Now, uh, who is financing private investment in infrastructure projects? Well, mostly it's financed by financial service institutions, primarily uh, commercial and investment banks. But in some regions, we have seen uh, an active role of other financiers like developers or uh, export credit agencies, multilateral banks. And despite that private finance financiers have increased their role over time in financing infrastructure, still 75% of the private investment in infrastructure in the middle and low income countries is co-financing from non-private actors, such as even banks, export credit agencies, or the public sector. Next slide. As I already mentioned, in order to attract uh, private investment into infrastructure and uh, establish it as an asset class, the financial performance is critical. Our data on equity performance shows that infrastructure as an asset class actually provides attractive and, and resilient uh, returns for investors. In this graph, in particular, what we are showing is that in the last decade's return for listed and unlisted infrastructure equities have strongly increased. The pandemic temporarily stopped uh, this trend, but it resumed in 2021. In particular, uh, unlisted infrastructure equities have provided higher risk adjust uh, returns over the entire decade, uh, over a both global equities and listed infrastructure equities. Next slide. Our data on debt performance also shows that infrastructure debt consistently performs better than non-infrastructure debt, and even more so in high-income countries. So this graph shows that infrastructure debt in high-income countries has lower default rates than middle and low-income countries, but in both cases, infrastructure debt remains less than non-infrastructure debt. Next slide. So the evidence uh, shows that infrastructure as an asset has, provides uh, attractive investment options for investors in order for them to, to diversify their uh, and optimize their portfolio. In this graph, we show the risk against the return of the infrastructure investments over a decade. So we can see that, for example, infrastructure debt provides a significantly higher return than the 10-year treasury bonds of developed economies at a slightly higher risk. If we move to listed infrastructure equities, well, in emerging markets, they have relatively a high risk and low return profile, but in the market, they provide considerably, um, considerable returns at a lower risk than average global equities. If we move to unlisted infrastructure equities, uh, they provide returns quite close to global equities at a slightly lower risk. So overall, infrastructure investments are provided good returns and have the potential to attract private capital. Next slide. But why, despite uh, this good financial performance, we see there's an stagnation in the private investment in infrastructure. Well, one of the reasons um, is one of the major bottlenecks actually in attracting private capital to infrastructure. It's the lack of bankable investment ready pipeline uh, of infrastructure projects. So creating this pipeline requires a strengthening of the infrastructure project preparation capabilities. So in this graph to the left, uh, which is based in our infra compass tool. It shows that currently there is space for improved project preparation capabilities across all regions, in particular uh, low income countries. Uh, infrastructure monitor attempts to, to explore the channeling of funds 
uh, to emerging economies for project preparation through the lenses of the project preparation facilities. We know that governments often lack the, the capacity and the resources for project preparation. So actually, PPFs, project preparation facilities, are playing an important role in supporting project preparation. Our analysis shows that since the 2000, their creation has grown exponentially. Over 80% of them were created after 2015. And also, in general, we see that they are providing technical and funding support for project preparation. They are mostly led by MDBs, and they are mainly providing support in developing regions like F Africa and Asia. Next slide, please. So wrapping up, to conclude, I can say that overall, uh, there continues to be a massive potential for private investment in infrastructure, given several factors. The large and unmet infrastructure gap, the stagnating, stagnating level of private investment in infrastructure projects, the ongoing attractive financial performance of infrastructure investments, the promising early trends for sustainable investment, the likelihood to uh, of significant new transactions uh, occurring given the 3.3 trillion of infrastructure stimulus announced by the G20 government uh, last year uh, around COVID, and the potential for strengthening project preparation capabilities that will create this pipeline of, of projects for the investors. So I'm going to stop here. Infrastructure Monitor has very uh, interesting findings, and I invite you all to, to visit our webpage and assess them in more detail. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And we did put as a handout the 2021 kind of findings, and then of course also please visit the Infrastructure Monitor website. Maybe one probing question. When I think of infrastructure, I, I think long-term. These are projects that that have implications for 30, 50 plus years. I'm wondering, you, you mentioned the impacts of COVID-19. I'm wondering if other shocks like the conflict in Ukraine, are you, do you see immediate impacts on infrastructure um, investment and projects, or does it remain relatively stable um, because of the long-term nature of these projects? Well, it depends on the type of asset also. And well, um, there are several angles here, but one of them is, unfortunately, there's a scarcity in data in order to see like immediate uh, impact of the of the events that are occurring. So we have uh, a significant lack, for example, for faults in that. But when we do see the data, given that infrastructure takes a long term, there is not like a direct impact or strong impact immediately so we that is one of the reasons why we have seen that it has been extended uh, over time and even though covid affected all of the sectors i can say that examples weren't affected for the infrastructure sector the force of, of project finance uh, of debt wasn't um, affected for infrastructure for example also as we can see equities uh, were significantly stalled in 2020, but quickly resumed. So we can see that there are other variables that are affecting infrastructure that are not necessarily tied to the global economy. And given that they're like long-term, uh, they're proved to be resilient along the time. Perfect. Thank you so much for this very helpful context, Cynthia. And we're gonna bring you back in in the, in the Q&A section. Uh, but now we're going to turn to our panelists. And first up, we have Imad Fakhouri from the World Bank. He is the Global Director of Infrastructure, Public-Private Partnerships, and the Guarantees Group there. Imad, we know the majority of infrastructure investment needed is in developing and emerging economies. And Cynthia's presentation has only underscored that. How do we drive finance to these markets? And more importantly, how do we promote sustainability in those investments to ensure that they're supporting sustainable development in the long term? Um, thank you, Kali. Um, thank you for having me here today. Very excited to be part of this very important series and looking forward to the discussions uh, 
and all the work that will lead up to the annual summit. Um, as we all know, sustainable and quality infrastructure is key to deliver inclusive economic growth, social progress, and climate action. We need it now more than ever to build back better, to encourage growth, growth in the face of overlapping global crises, the, the ones that you even mentioned. And the needs we know are enormous, right? So uh, we have done our calculations in the World Bank and, and to meet the SDGs and the Paris climate commitments, uh, emerging markets and developing economies would need to annually actually spend 4.5% on average of their GDP um, on infrastructure. And usually what gets even more neglected and another 2.7% of GDP annually on operations and maintenance. Private participation has been representing no more than 10 to 15 percent of the total infrastructure investments in low and middle income countries and probably have averaged about 80 billion since 2000. Right. So the gap is quite good, even though um, we, we, we know that uh, you asked a good question. Also, um, Kali, uh, private participation in infrastructure, we've, we've been tracking this for low and middle income countries since 1990. Um, in 2020, we had a drop of 52% because of COVID, right? And we got to really the lowest level since 2004. In 21, we saw a rebound. It increased by 49%, but it was on average 12% lower than the previous five-year uh, average. So what does that tell us? We know that public budgets are going to be insufficient to meet the infrastructure needs. We know that catalyzing private investment is critical. However, we need to actually scale up, see a step change in private capital mobilization for quality and sustainable infrastructure if we are to reach the targets that we have put for all of us uh, globally. And we always assume it's the lack of capital, right? And that's not really the full story. There's more than 120 trillion of assets under management and banks and institutional investors could be re redirected towards developing countries. But there are four key challenges that make this difficult. The first is an inadequate enabling environments and institutional foundations that are preventing investment systematically and at scale. The second is the lack of pipeline or bankable projects that are attractive to the private sector. The third is the perception among investors of high levels of risk. And, and, and lastly, the poor sustainability of infrastructure investments due to low um, uh, quality. So the World Bank, along with global initiatives we administer, like the public-private infrastructure advisory facility that works on the critical upstream, or the global infrastructure facility that works on project preparation, we work with our client countries to address these challenges head on. We work upstream to provide technical assistance, project preparation support, innovative financing options that lower the risk for private participation. Of course, all of this combines to help these countries attract private investment and develop a pipeline of bankable climate uh, smart projects. Finally, when it comes to sustainability of financing, as you asked in this latter part of your question, there are two I think areas to consider. One is the need for, fi we need finance that is over time attracted naturally to opportunities in developing uh, countries because it sees value and solid enabling environments. And that's precisely the patient work I just mentioned that we and other trusted advisors, institutions can do in tandem collectively with governments. The second uh, has to do with pursuing right profits while prioritizing social responsibility and environmental sustainability. So the focus on corporate ESG issues, which has gained momentum and is expected to stick. This means that we're no longer discussing if financial institutions should take this into consideration, but how and with increasingly more detail, how to measure in a standardized way, how to ensure we're not greenwashing and how to seek out more ESG friendly uh, opportunities. And to promote that, we need to increase the resources for technical assistance and incentive programs to mainstream the quality infrastructure investment principles, ESG sustainability standards, and other best practices. We need to promote harmonization and standardization of ESG sustainability indicators. And we need to really facilitate the usage and uh, of and access to sustainability or green link bonds and certifications in developing countries. And one concrete way I would mention is the partnership between the GIF, the Global Infrastructure Facility, uh, and the FAST Infra uh, Initiative, which is a private sector-led, globally uh, applicable labeling system that is trying to identify uh, 
and evaluate uh, sustainable infrastructure uh, assets. This is the type of work that we need to support. And I think more of that will be coming out um, and hopefully sticking as we move along that trajectory. Back to you, thanks. Thank you so much. I think what you've laid out really is almost the DNA of building bridges, how we need these different groups to play their role, whether it be the multilateral development banks who are who are helping to build these project uh, projects and enabling conditions with governments. We need private capital to come in, these um, financing facilities that you're mentioning. So it really shows that all of these groups have a role to play. And, and I thank you for painting that picture. Uh, I couldn't have asked you to do it better. <laughs> and um, now we're gonna go over to um, one of our private finance actors, uh, Jean-Francis Douche from um, Edmund Rothschild, who heads up their infrastructure program globally and also is uh, their CEO in the UK. And uh, and also I mentioned that Edmund Rothschild is one of Building Bridges 2022 sponsors. Jean-Francis, on your website, you note that sustainability is at the core of EDR's investment strategy in infrastructure debt. What does that process look like practically? How do you go about this? What positive or exclusionary filters do you apply to the in infrastructure investment decision-making process? So, so good morning, everyone. So, so first of all, I'm very happy to, to, to participate to that panel. Uh, today, we, I will maybe speak more from the angle of our uh, infrastructure debt activity, because what we do through it is we, we have raised in the last seven years five billion of money from uh, main institutions. I think it's an interesting angle because we were talking about private money uh, supporting the, all the, the goals we have, whether it's the development of infrastructure, but also all the, the the contribution of infrastructure to sustainable development. And uh, as you rightly say, and I, and I have to say that that was perhaps one thing that uh, made me join the, the EDR group uh, 18 years ago, uh, the group has always been strongly committed to ESG. It's part of, a, of our DNA and uh, ESG is definitely embedded in, uh, in infrastructure. So um, in terms of how we approach it, um, Although I know you're probably asking me more to, to comment on the, you know, what are the, the criteria, the filters we use, I guess it, this criteria applies from, yes, the sourcing, identification of projects, but also in the way now we can also structure uh, an investment, uh, how we monitor and report it from investors. And, and, and all that actually is almost a, like a loop where you need to make sure that uh, when you source an investment, you also have in mind what uh, institutional investors need to, to, to report. And, uh, and all that is part of a strategy. So the good news is, I would say that we, we are probably part of these uh, debt uh, investors who uh, have been actually supporting for years uh, what I would call as the, the sustainable development goals that, uh, that, that there are. And, and most recently, the EU emphasized, for example, the, the FIT uh, for 55 initiative, which is really aimed at uh, accelerating uh, the decarbonization with, you know, a reduction of CO2 by, by 50% by 2030. And this is, I would say, what will drive uh, the selection of investments. Um, and I remember, you know, we, we mentioned renewable energy, but it's not only that, it's uh, the whole energy transition. There's a Gen 2, Generation 2 of, uh, of uh, energy uh, I would say infrastructure projects that need to be implemented, whether it's storage, whether it's a uh, you know, new solution like hydrogen or offshore wind. So all that is what we're going to analyze. Green mobility was mentioned as well. Uh, and I think the, the first point of call is you need to work with uh, saying, OK, can I do I have a grid uh, that I'm following when I source an investment? That grid can be, you know, follow the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals but are also goals that we will set to ourselves and uh, which, you know, when I mentioned the reporting, ultimately what we wish to be able to say is this is the impact that an investment we've made has had. And so what we measure in concrete words is uh, the CO2 emission avoided by an asset, by a portfolio. We also measure the uh, trajectory against the uh, two degrees uh, trajectory. And that, that's really also something that we do uh, because we, we have, uh, I would say, the, the, the skills, the, the, the team uh, 
perhaps uh, understanding of the technical aspects of the investments we 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 bring on board from the of our investors but we also use independent consultants to have a, a, a kind of independent opinion from experts in the field uh, other exclusions definitely the obvious one is uh, is coal uh, but i think you know the important thing is really each time now we look at uh, at an investment and across all sectors because you know we we mention a lot energy transition we uh, mention a lot uh, renewable like i mentioned even within energy the technological developments which are amazing actually because they really uh, broaden the investment reach the investment universe that can create portfolio diversification but the green mobility is important energy efficiency in software infrastructure is key and ESG is not on only environment, it's also social. So digital infrastructure, for example, is a key contributor of a job creation that's essential. That's also what we measure. You know, what is the impact on society? Uh, governance is crucial. And I'm sure that uh, our panelists from the World Bank, uh, they have very, very uh, stringent criteria, but they are important as well. This is how also we can ensure that we have a, a very comprehensive approach of how we can support uh, the sustainable development, how this infrastructure can be greener and uh, help, I would say, even beyond the decarbonization, even beyond uh, the social impact, there's really a, a, a duty uh, to, to, to protect the planet and to provide society with a sustainable uh, infrastructure and services. Thank you so much for that and for reminding us that this isn't all about necessarily climate, there's there's social issues here, digital infrastructure, this, this spans so many facets of life. I'm curious, and, and to ask kind of a probing question because of, of our earlier comments, are you looking in emerging and developing markets as well? And, and if, I mean, if it makes up a smaller portion of your portfolio, which I imagine it does based on the data we saw in Cynthia's uh, pro, uh, presentation, what are the pain points for, for entering these other markets and, and, and pushing things in, in those markets as well? So that's still a question for me, I suppose. Uh, yes, I mean, on, on our infrastructure debt uh, investment business, this is a development. And uh, we, we are uh, this year looking to, to invest in emerging markets. As a, as, a, as a company and within our infrastructure business, we did a lot of advisory uh, in emerging markets. So I think, you know, the good thing is there's a, now a kind of global <laughs> understanding and awareness of what is at stake. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the World Bank as a, you know, panelist has, has really uh, put the emphasis on uh, what the challenges are. But I would say the, the, the good news as well in emerging markets is, I'll give you a concrete example, you know, for example, when we, we worked on a, on a PPP, road PPP in, a, in, a, in Senegal, 15 years ago, uh, already in the, the scope of work of the, the, the way we wanted to tender the project and draft the concession agreement, there were, you know, job creation was important, local uh, task force was important, helping, you know, you had sites with uh, uh, water, stagnant water, health impact, we were working on it. So I think the, the, yes, you need to bring the capital. I think bringing the capital to emerging market is key. The good news is I think there's lots of uh, institutions who have now understood in more developed markets what is at stake, what they expect. I believe they're ready uh, to follow asset managers to bring them to emerging markets. And the truth is, you know, you, you talked of uh, bridging the, the, the gaps. Uh, it's all about working with multilateral institutions like the World Bank, credit uh, export agencies, bilateral institutions. And with also the fact that as much as there perhaps a more, uh, more communication on the EG on sustainable development, the truth is, for the last uh, thirty decades, uh, three decades, I've been lucky enough to work in that, uh, in that field. There's always been EG at the core of infrastructure, and in the way uh, projects would be defined, tendered, and executed. So the the barrier to entry are more to make sure that we bring sufficient capital, we attract capital because the needs are ever increasing. But a lot of the principles, a lot of how we can execute it is, is already, I would say, part of the skills we, we have.
that's very encouraging to hear. Thank you so much, Jean-Francis. And we're now move to David from the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Uh, and he is the lead on sustainable finance there. We're going to kind of shift a little bit um, and because IISD is a forefront thought leader on nature-based infrastructure. And we've been talking a lot about the various types of infrastructure. And I'm wondering if for our audience, you can provide some examples of nature-based solutions in the infrastructure space and tell us what in your view is needed to ensure that capital flows go to these kind of solutions. And particularly, of course, in these markets that we're, we're talking about right now. Hi, everyone, and thank you very much, Kelly, for having me here today. So first of all, I believe that nature-based infrastructure, or, or MBM for short, should, should play an important role in closing the global infrastructure deficit. So let me start with explaining what NBI is. I, I always define NBI as a natural landscape features or ecosystem functions that provide a service that is normally provided by built infrastructure. So Examples could be wetlands, providing water treatment, for example, green roofs, providing stormwater management, or for example, sand dunes, providing flood protection. Um, based on IASD's uh, sustenance valuation or severe assessments of various NBI projects, we found that NBI is up to 50%, so 50% cheaper than traditional gray infrastructure when providing the same infrastructure service. In addition, NBI provides 28% better value for money than green infrastructure when we account for the various environmental and social externalities. Also, we found that if we met our current global infrastructure needs, but we swapped just 11% of this with NBI instead of with traditional infrastructure, we would save 248 billion US dollars each year out of the 4.3 trillion US dollars needed annually. So this infrastructure swap could create additional benefits worth of up to 489 billion US dollars every year, a figure that equals the annual GDP of countries such as Australia, for example. So this is all great, but then why we are not seeing more financing going into MBI? So first of all, uh, policymakers and uh, investors systematically fell back on civil engineering solutions on the assumption that they have proven and verifiable track records and that the costs and revenues can be monitored and reported with more certainty. Uh, just as a side note, uh, both groups systematically overlook that built assets often exceed the forecasted capital and operating costs, especially as extreme weather becomes more frequent. Um, also, ISD's Nature-Based Infrastructure Global Resource Center was created to ad address exactly this evidence gap. So over the next few years, we will develop more than 40 assessments comparing NBI with built infrastructure for a wide range of assets and, and create a database on the economic performance of NBI. Another challenge is that capital market solutions designed to channel funds into NBI or nature-based infrastructure, such as impact and resilience bonds, are very difficult to implement in developing countries where the infrastructure deficit is the biggest and government budgets are the most constrained. So in these countries, financial markets often are unsophisticated with limited uh, local investor demand, while governance risks and data uncertainties are very high. There is also actually a lot of literature of how this can be improved, so I won't go into details here. But I just want to emphasize that more political leadership and targeted regulation would be needed to encourage innovation in financing NBI. For example, regulations on stormwater fees were fu fundamental to expand NBI for urban stormwater management. Also, we need financing instruments that provide innovative solutions to monetize the benefits of NBI in, in order to make them financially viable investments. So in, in other words, they enable treating the delivery of ecosystem services as revenue streams. So the, the good news is that there are actually quite a few of these already, but they're just not being used enough. So to conclude, governments at all levels, as well as investors, uh, still lack the understanding, information, and the advice on uh, why and how to make better use of MBI. So this needs to be addressed in order to channel more financing into the space. We also need to improve the confidence of stakeholders in the performance of MBI 
by demonstrating a more robust uh, track record. Um, I believe uh, that ignoring what role NBI could play in closing the infrastructure deficit would be a missed opportunity. Thank you. Thanks so much, David. I mean, I think this is fascinating because when most of us think of infrastructure, we think of, as you said, built things that are built. And we probably aren't so much thinking about mangroves and sand dunes and green roofs, but but we absolutely should be. And I think this is a really important point. And I'm going to come back in the, the Q&A to ask you some, some more questions about kind of dematerializing infrastructure. But before we get to that section, I'm going to call on Jerome, who is BlackRock's Managing Director of Infrastructure Solutions, BlackRock also being another partner and sponsor of our 2022 edition. Jerome, thank you so much for being here. I noticed that BlackRock offers quite a range of infrastructure solutions, um, including one category that's specifically focused on climate infrastructure. So do you see environmental and social impacts of infrastructure as material in your investment decision-making process for all of your solutions? And what is specifically different about that climate infrastructure piece that you offer? Okay, thank you. First of all, I would say that um, BlackRock, is, as you know, is a big organization. Uh, so I represent a, a team that is called Infrastructure Solutions. And our focus is solely on investing in infrastructure alongside third-party managers like Antin, EQT, GIP, Stonepeak, etc. So to come back to your question about climate infrastructure, um, it is true that it is a very important topic for, for BlackRock. Uh, it is It started many years back with a direct team doing renewables, which has since uh, then be, be rebranded Climate Infrastructure Platform. And this platform now has more than $10 billion of assets under management and has been at the forefront of investing into renewables and then more recently into, into carbon capture or uh, EV charging stations. So it's definitely a big, big part of what we're doing and people, our investors can access these climate infrastructure solutions by investing directly into their, their funds. There's another part which is purely targeting at emerging markets, which is the Climate Finance Partnership, which was really raised at the time when there was effectively the governments of France, Germany, numerous US institutions that decided that effectively we needed to bring solutions to emerging markets. And this is the same uh, idea that we need to bring effectively renewables to or climate infrastructure two countries that are less developed uh, and need them the most. So this is also something which is part of this climate infrastructure platform. When we come back to BlackRock, generally speaking, if you hear Larry Fink, one of the things he said recently is that he believes the biggest opportunity in alternatives uh, in the future will be the intersection of infrastructure and sustainability. And here, uh, I, I, I agree 100% with him. If you go back to my team, uh, which has $8 billion of uh, assets, uh, LP commitments, we have three mega trends uh, that we've identified. Uh, we call them the three Ds. One, the first one is decarbonization. The second one is digitalization. And the third, third one is uh, decentralization. decentralization. And effectively, decarbonization is, I think, the key one because there is a lot of crossover with both digitalization and decentralization. So to give you an idea, when we think about decarbonization, the obvious opportunities tend to be, people think about renewables, but there's much more than that. There's an entire ecosystem to be built around distributed grids, um, smart meters, energy efficiency measures, um, uh, district heating and cooling, EV charging stations and the like. But then what we're seeing is that there's a convergence of energy transition and other sectors. So if you think about public transport, we heard about green mobility before. This is exactly that. We can invest into public bus operators and effectively help them through capital to move into more sustainable fleets, either electric buses or the ones that run with renewable uh, fuel. And then for data centers also, uh, we can invest into green data centers that are powered by, by renewable energy. Coming back into your, into your question about social and environmental impact solutions, clearly, as Jean-Francis uh, said before, 
ESG is fully integrated in the investment process, and we follow the same approach as he said, uh, which is what we call avoid, assess, and advance. So whenever we see opportunities, we will exclude sectors like CLOL, which are definitely not part of the Paris Agreement, uh, not a fit. Assess is obviously making sure that uh, ESG is integrated through the investment process, both before we make the investment and after to collect ESG and impact KPIs, which is very important. And then advance is effectively where uh, we really manage actively and report transparently on what we've achieved, which is really some of where sometimes we, we are seeing we're a bit lacking because uh, it's very hard to get the data uh, so far. And then when our clients ask us for sustainable solutions, we can provide them with the view that there are meaningful investment opportunities to advance, reduce, and offset carbon emissions. So advance uh, on the advanced side, I discussed already about that. It's all about renewables, the ecosystem around the energy transition, and the like. So directly or indirectly uh, avoiding emissions. But effectively, when you think about reduce and offset, there are also big opportunities. On the reduction side, this is what I talked about effectively reducing the carbon emission footprint of existing uh, industries or like public transportation, et cetera, and offsetting. That's really now where go we're going into uh, technologies potentially that are a bit less advanced like carbon capture. But we're already seeing with technologies that are more mature like energy from waste. A lot of people are already thinking about, okay, I'm not only removing waste from landfills and so reducing uh, methane emissions, but I'm also potentially capturing this methane and then putting it down in, on the ground. So really, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of thoughts on the, on the offset. And then maybe you're asking me about emerging markets, what we do. To be frank with you, in my team, we have mostly uh, clients that are public pension funds from uh, Europe, the US, uh, OECD countries. And then we tend to focus mostly at this stage on OECD countries and opportunistically invest in emerging markets. Great, thank you so much, Jerome. I think that was, I, I really like these, the the three Ds. I think that's something that we mm. can all, all think about and maybe uh, we'll add a fourth <laughs> one here when I bring David back to talk about dematerialization. But I think this is a really helpful thing to remember that, that there are these mega trends that are affecting these. And mm -hmm. I love that you see it so much as an opportunity. So we're going to jump into a discussion with all of our panelists in just a second. But before we get there, I wanted to take a quick second to see what our audience is thinking. So it's time for another poll. Audience, what do you see as the biggest challenge to closing the infrastructure investment gaps in a sustainable way? Is it that sustainable infrastructure is less financially attractive, a lack of innovative financing solutions, higher perceived technology risk, challenges in mitigating developed country risks, lack of bankable project pipelines, or a lack of revenue streams from infrastructure assets? So if everyone could just have a vote there, and we'll come back to that in a second, but I'll just ask my panelists to all turn their cameras back on for uh, a little bit of a discussion. And Cynthia, I wanted to start with you, um, if you are there. Um, let's just see here. Perfect, Cynthia. So you mentioned this idea of infrastructure as being its own asset class and that there's, a, I believe you said a G20 kind of process for this. What does that look like? How can this be accomplished? How do you see that idea of, of infrastructure as an asset class? Well, uh, in a way, infrastructure as an asset class is to ground in uh, private into infrastructure. You know, infrastructure, a particular type of investment. So it provides new sources of, of returns and better diversification of the risk. So infrastructure assets can be particularly attractive due to, and we already discussed this, the, their time horizons, uh, high yields that they have, the returns that are uncorrelated with business cycles. So therefore, they, they provide opportunities for diversification of the private sector. So it's an opportunity. 
So overall, uh, at least I understand that the government is not a resilient return for, for the investors. Uh, for example, infrastructure debt uh, remains less risky than non-infrastructure debt or listed infrastructure equities in developed markets are performing uh, or are providing significantly higher returns at a lower risk than in general global equities and mostly unlisted infrastructure equities that have, have significant higher results than global equities with, with lower risk uh, during the entire decade. So there's a potential there. That is why the G20 is it's committed to to this roadmap of infrastructure as an asset class in order to entice more private investment into infrastructure. Perfect. Thank you so much. It broke up a little bit there, but I think we've got the major points around the the long time horizons and 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 how this is, it can can balance out some of these other uh, asset classes. Maybe David, over to you um, on this idea of of dematerializing, because I think we, we think a lot about decarbonizing infrastructure, but I, I'm also curious on uh, some points we were talking about when prepping for this webinar about the fact of the sheer material needed to build um, the amount of infrastructure. So how do you, how does ISD view that? How do you view that? Do you see this as another important consideration when we're thinking about infrastructure of the future? Yes, definitely. I mean, as I mentioned in my intro, that uh, uh, nature-based infrastructure has to be part of the solution of, of, of the infrastructure deficit. Um, uh, according to some estimates, we're actually seeing 90 trillion US dollars deficit in the next 15 years uh, in, in infrastructure deficit. Uh, so the problem is that 70% uh, of all carbon emissions come from infrastructure. So if we kind of try to fill this 90 trillion worth of infrastructure, uh, that mean, it means that we have to like triple the, the, the current infrastructure stock. Uh, but if you look at the, its carbon footprint and if you look at the environmental footprint of infrastructure, obviously it shows that there's going to be a problem uh, at the end of the day if you just do it the, the business as usual way. So what we are actually uh, talking about at ISD, that it's not only enough to actually uh, build sustainable infrastructure, but we should try to explore more, more and more the use of nature-based solutions. Uh, and, and I think it's very important to, to keep in mind that nature-based solutions doesn't have to be like a standalone nature-based infrastructure, like a forest or something like that. But the, it could be uh, like different hybrid solutions as well, where you have a built infrastructure that is being complemented by a nature-based solution. Uh, I mean, for example, one assessment we have done in the Netherlands, um, uh, it was basically a bunch of hotels uh, that actually used sand dunes as a way to, to mitigate flood risk. I mean, that actually, provides a very good example of how uh, built infrastructure or great infrastructure can be used together with nature-based solutions. Thank you so much. Um, our poll is now closed and it seems like the top uh, challenges that the audience are perceiving is lack of bankable projects, some of the challenges specific to developing country risks and lack of innovative financing solutions. And so I wanna turn to Imad and just ask a question about solutions. I mean, if you could wave a magic wand tomorrow and have, uh, you know, let's say the the system working together more efficiently, and particularly the the private capital sector or the private finance sector, what would you like to see? What do you think is needed to start addressing some of these big gaps? So, listen, I don't like the 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 approach to try to think of a magical wand right because this is this is very complex and and it requires actually working from upstream to downstream in parallel tracks systematically in the right sequence depending on the country context we're trying to help to support to get this right um, uh, and it and it takes also collective work working all of us together the mdbs dfis the donors led by the client governments of these countries. They have to own this. They have to have the political commitment to want this. And of course, in partnership with the private sector, with international organizations, with civil society, uh, uh, and, 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 and so on. It, it has to be a broad collective approach, given the, the size of the challenge and given you know, the time frame we have to act and scale up and, 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 and to, to deliver um, on this, so from the perspective of MDBs and 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 DFIs, uh, 
um, I think we're going to have to stay the course with a, with a more coordinated approach working from upstream to downstream. Um, obviously, we do come in with financing, as everyone knows, like the World Bank provides co-financing to facilitate the large projects, to create and, and enable the reforms through uh, uh, development policy lending uh, um, uh, and, and to, to work to mobilize international support and concessional financing rights in, in difficult situations and post-conflict countries or remote areas, etc. But I think the more important role uh, that is more important than money um, is, is the technical assistance, is the work we do um, uh, to address the binding constraints that we mentioned, that we spoke of, that I mentioned at least um, earlier. So we we see last year showed a rebound, right, in private participation in infrastructure. And that suggests that there's a recovery that's underway. Um, but But let's remember there are very tightening further fiscal and financing conditions that are going to require selectivity and attention to the quality investments that can support multiple economic and social goals, um, such as green, resilient, and inclusive investments. And as economic stimulus lows, credit conditions further tightens and uncertainty um, actually from the overlapping crisis intensifies, there'll be even a greater need for reforms to scale up private investments in infrastructure. And this, again, will require working collectively so we can enable private sector solutions and to use this upcoming period where there is a heightened risks and challenges to put in place the stronger foundations for a post-crisis recovery. So MDBs will need to strengthen and accelerate their support to emerging markets and developing economies, governments to address the factors uh, that are impeding um, investments um, and we would need basically to collectively work, as I've mentioned, um, so that we can support country institutions and programs to enable private participation, de-risk sector and projects, um, and address the low credit worthiness of contracting authorities so the private sector can do more, expand project pipelines and scale up and improve project preparation uh, quality and bankability, as, as, as the audience has recognized quite rightly. And we need to accelerate the infrastructure system transitions to improve infrastructure quality standards and governance and, uh, and, and promoting sustainable financing. And we need to facilitate institutional investors to finance infrastructure, including local institutional investors. And there was a question um, in the chat that someone asked about aggregation platforms, and I responded that that's going to be key. So we will need to collaborate with the governments, global entities, other MDBs to prioritize the investments and, and create the laws and regulations that would enable them, strengthen capacities of governments and help them work to prepare bankable projects and develop the pipelines. And, and build more project preparation facilities by scaling facilities like the GIF and the PF that I've mentioned, uh, as well as doing national ones to help governments improve the quality of infrastructure investments that can uh, deliver on that. And we need to ensure that investments are made within the framework, as several speakers have said, of a green, resilient and inclusive development a filtering system, and finally mitigate the risks um, by providing credit enhancements, guarantees, and political risk insurance. I think there is no magical wand. There has to be consistent work collectively on parallel tracks, depending on the country context that we're working in, that keeps moving us forward along that trajectory. Thank you so much, Imad. And uh, I'm watching our time tick away, and but I actually think that's a, a fantastic note to to close on um, and I, I think that what the picture that all of you have collectively painted for us today is one that is very much in the DNA of building bridges which is that every actor has a role to play and a, and a unique and significant role and that there's a lot of there as you said you meant there's no magic wands there's just a lot of hard work and, and collaboration that is required and I'm really grateful that all of these different types of organizations, uh, the World Bank, an NGO and IISD, uh, the, the Global Infrastructure Hub, and in, in really as a think tank, and, and then also, of course, our private sector 
partners came to the table today to have this discussion in an open way. And I think it shows what is possible. And, and with that, I will bring us to a close and thank everyone uh, so much for being here. We will be back with more webinars in the lead up this fall. And the big event, of course, will be happening October 3rd to 6th. And I thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day. And I hope to see you in the next one and maybe even in Geneva in October. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Mm -hmm.